so that our usual means of representing architecture, plan, section, elevation, and so on, um, tend to isolate architecture out. And what I'm trying to do in these drawings is put architecture back into the idea of, of a landscape, even though this is a totally self-referential landscape. It's, there's no, there are no trees, mountains, or sky except at the end. But the drawings are the means. The, these are the only drawings that exist. There were no preliminary drawings. Yes. That's interesting because if you uh, this little exhibition that came here from New York, the photographs of, of projects. If you look at some of the geomechanical machines, the flying machines which are based on the idea of organizing the, the um, geomechanic, I, I mean the geomagnetic, excuse me, field that exists around the earth in order to levitate objects, in this case uh, dwellings. If you look at some of those, you'll see that the projection tower is, re the top of the projection tower is related to this because the idea of the projection tower is that it is growing in its own mechanical way, things which leave it, they, they, they depart. It's, um, it's hard to do in a, in a, in a still drawing, but they, they, they're meant to depart and to leave. So you're right. You're, you're picking up on the aerodynamic, which I think a very perceptive uh, observation. Yes? The sun? Well, obviously, when you're underground, you can't live with the sun <laughs> because it's not there. <laughs> well, you know, it's a very big question, but I, I, you just simply, when I talk about this new climate, I mean there's a new climate. There's a new, there isn't any sun. There's something above, on the surface of the earth, in a way we're drawn toward this great central orb, the sun which is the source of life on Earth. And once you enter into the Earth and deprived of that, suddenly you're, you're focusing more toward the center of the Earth. The center of the Earth becomes the focus, the locus of forces and climate, rather than the sun. So the electromagnetic forces that are in the Earth are a source of power. There's, there's geothermal power, there's, there's a whole life, there's a whole dynamic and kinetic in the earth that this city relates to. And a way of life is created out of that. And, and I suppose what I'm, I'm addressing indirectly is, is that the surface life above is something which derives from its climate of forces too. So, yeah, go ahead. The which? Myth and consumption. Myth and consumption. Good, um, okay. We live in a, in a world of mythical consumption or the consumption of myths. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, how your mythical project possibly resists consumption because in the beginning you commented on sort of Well, I'm substituting the idea of experience for consumption. Actually, actually, it's very easy just to say. <laughs> hard to do it. Hard to do it. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Well, not how consumption, does not, not, how yeah. Does, how does it, how does your project distinguish itself from the general one of consumption? Oh, I don't know. I, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you probably have a better idea than I do. No, I'm not being facetious. I'm really serious. I, 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 it's hard for me to pull out that far outside of what I've done and be able to comment, you know, in the way. I said, no, I, your question is a serious question. I'm not, I'm not denigrating it. I just simply don't know. Um, the reference to consumerism as opposed to consumption, obviously we consume, time consumes. Uh, you know, if this idea of the second law of thermodynamics is, uh, is real, then everything in a sense is consumed in a kind of cosmic way. Uh, but the idea of consumerism is something yet again. And You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to your question right off hand. I'll think about it. Yeah. Why do you feel that um, this, this new culture that's created in this model we want to be emerged from this circle? What would bring it there? Well, as I said in my remarks, that I, I think that things want to return to their origin. We want to go home. I mean, we, we travel, we go places, we, we do things. But eventually, we want to go back to where we began. And the human culture is a, a culture on the earth, not within the earth by nature. I mean, the earth is a place we bury the dead, you know, after all. And it's not what we used, are used to thinking of as a, a home for human beings. I mean, there are, you know, worms in the earth. So I think that the impulse would be to return, uh, inevitably, and to bring, it's also part of the idea of rebirth, I mean, if the Earth is a womb, if there's such a thing as Mother Earth, and one enters back into that, then one wants to be born out of it again, you know, eventually into the world of light and space. Well, not from the beginning, at least in the hypothesis, because in the beginning one is escaping from something, one is hiding, one is secret, one is driven by other forces. But once that fades, then the impulse to return is, I think, inevitable. So are we, yeah, we have a few more now. I can stay here as long as you can, I mean, I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But often we, we find things by indirection, you know? It's, it's very funny. We, we don't set out to find a thing and yet we find it. Um, the hypothesis here is, yes, all the reasons are negative for doing this, and yet something positive is found. I think this is often the case in life, at least from my experience. Neil? Well, I think it, it reflects, uh, you know, this idea of indeterminacy. I mean, the, the, the indeterminate geometry of, of nature 
is uh, at play here in this project because of the, this idea of going into the earth and of being part of a set of really indeterminate forces, ultimately indeterminate. I mean, I was always fascinated uh, with the fact that our chemists and our present high technological civilization haven't been able to chemically analyze a cubic foot of topsoil to really break it down to all its constituents. It's so complex. The level of complexity, um, not even adding on yet this idea of uncertainty that modern science has given us and left us with, the idea that we can't really determine anything completely anyway, leads us inevitably to a kind of indeterminacy that I've wanted to explore in this project. Um, the old geometry was based on the idea of that we could know the, the nature of reality in, in its particulars, in its physical uh, limits. But the new understanding, the, the understanding that you know, I have come to uh, uh, finally, not that I have abandoned the other geometry, is this geometry of indeterminacy. Jerry. This is very interesting that uh, you are generating a whole new body of shapes and relationships that we've not seen before ever. And what I'm really interested in knowing about you is what is it that's driving you really to produce those shapes? Hmm. Very that's a, I like that, yeah. Well, I don't know, because if you, if you set out somehow to begin to explore, I mean, if you, if, you, if you say to yourself, well, I'm going to look at new possibilities, then you begin to push yourself into those areas, inevitably. Um, and I feel I'm just entering in at the end of the centricity drawings, as Neil pointed out. I began to explore this kind of geometry. And um, with this project, I went a bit further with it. Actually, I was hoping to present tonight maybe the, the latest project, which I've, I've been working on, but I wasn't able to do that, which again pushes the idea of, of exploring what these might mean to us. I don't know. I don't know if this is, uh, I can't say, and what I say in my remarks is that an experiment is something you don't know the outcome of when you start. Otherwise, it's not an experiment, right? So these are kinds of experiments, they're thought experiments, and they take the form of drawings, and it, ultimately, it's really up to you, all of you, each, each of you, really, each of you more than all of you, to decide whether there's anything here of value. Um, I'll continue on my way, but the reason I've come here to show you this is to let you make your own judgment. But it is about experimentation, about looking into the, the corners that haven't been as thoroughly looked into. Okay. Yeah. A morbid? Mo morbid? It just. Yeah, by morbid, I assume you're referring to death. I don't think it's unconscious. I, it depends on what you call joy. You know, uh, to me, that the, the, uh, you know, there's joy in this work for me, anyway. Um, it's deprived of the usual, shall we say, middle-class accoutrements, for sure. Uh, <laughs> but you know, this there is something that you raise with the word morbid, which I accept completely, because it has to do with this idea of mortality, with death, which in our culture is something which is, and in our personal lives, is something very difficult for us to confront in any term. So there is this confrontation with this idea of mortality, with the death of things in my work, definitely. 
I hate to end on that note. Can't we have? Can we, can't we do another question or more? Okay. Who's going to write the movie? I mean, I, this is the problem I've always. <laughs> Not really. Not really, because um, ultimately I consider myself just, you know, an architect. And my concern is architecture. And to me, architecture is woven into life wholly. So, in that sense, there's a relation to the idea of a narrative drama that you might see on the stage or on the screen. But um, no, I don't, I, I'm, I'm an architect. I'm, I, I don't really consider myself a storyteller. Um, even though there's a narrative dimension to the work. Okay, well, right, thank you. Yeah, we'll go have some dinner. That's a great audience.